Hello, a very warm welcome to all of you and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Today, we are going to embark upon the second chapter and the second session for environment and ecology in our target prelims 2022. Overall, till now, we have covered various different subjects and we shall be covering few more subjects in the coming days. If you are liking these videos and these sessions, please, please click on the like button and the subscribe button and also click on the bell icon to receive the notification. Now, having said that, yesterday when we started our discussion for environment and ecology, in the first session we discussed upon the various different static portions of environment and ecology such as ecosystem, habitat, biodiversity and so on. Today, we are going to discuss about the species which have remained in use as well as the protected areas which have remained in use in the past one year and a half. So thereby, that will make your task much easier in order to revise those species which are important and also to understand few of the very relevant details and nuances which can be useful for your prelims examination. So, in this session, not only shall we be taking up many of the different questions, but through each of these questions, we shall try to target two to three different areas in order to get a better understanding about each of these protected areas as well as these endangered species. So, without further ado, let us begin our discussion and starting with the first question. Now, the question is, which of the following are correct with reference to the region of Hograkan in Karnataka. Now, this is a particular region in Karnataka in the Chikmangalur district of Karnataka. Now, let us take a look at the options and let us understand more about this region, why this has been in news. So, the first statement is, it has been declared as a biodiversity heritage site. This is actually correct. Hograkan along with certain areas in the Sindhudurg district of Maharashtra and so on, they have been declared as biodiversity heritage site. Now, what is the requirement for an area to be declared as a BHS or a heritage site? Ideally, the flora and fauna in that region should be very, very specific and endemic to that particular area. Sometimes, any particular area can also have very specific kind of vegetation which you don't end up finding in many different places and that makes it a heritage site. Now also, in certain areas you have very old trees and those old trees also make it a parameter to be declared that and that region to be declared as a heritage site. So that is why Hograkan is a biodiversity heritage site. This is an area in the region of Karnataka which is dotted with the Shola forests. And not only the forested area, because in the southern part of the country, especially in the region around Nilgiris, you have many forested regions. So why is this area and why has it been declared as a BHS? That is because the Shola forests, they are dotted with large spaces of grasslands as well. And that presents a very unique picturesque view to anyone who visits this area. And as you can observe, this is a kind of a high altitude area which is dotted with Shola forest, but at the same time, it also has significant amount of grasslands which are present there. Now, it is a coastal ecosystem which supports a wide variety of species. While it does support a wide variety of species, it is not a coastal ecosystem. So the second statement shall be incorrect. Now, immediately, when you know that the second statement is incorrect, immediately mark out all those areas where option 2 is given here. And by the way, we also know that option 1 is correct. So, that also gives you the ability to eliminate the third option. So, automatically, you are left with the correct answer without even looking at the two remaining statements. Always bring that to use. Now, being in close proximity to Bhadra Tiger Reserve, it serves as a wildlife corridor. Now, what is a wildlife corridor? A wildlife corridor, as the name in itself tells you and as it suggests, 
it is a kind of a passage which connects two different protected areas. So for example, let's suppose you have one protected area or one tiger reserve here, another protected area or a wildlife sanctuary here. Now they are in isolation. But then the animals, the fauna which is living there, they can always move from one place to another. They don't know the boundaries of the national park and the protected areas. But then the faunal species, when they move from a forested area to another one, they generally choose a path which is also forested. So many of the times, the forested areas, they are connected with each other through a narrow strip or a smaller strip of forested region. And this is what is referred to as a corridor, a wildlife corridor. Okay, so this biodiversity heritage site basically serves as a wildlife corridor between the Bhadra Tiger Reserve and the Kudremukh Protected Area. So, and by the way, Kudremukh Protected Area, another important thing to note about that is, while it is very rich in different species and various different biodiversity, that is also a region which is very rich in iron deposits. So that is how you can always interrelate it with the physiography that you have read in geography and that will always give you a better sense of recall at the time of examination. So it is between Bhadra and Kudremuk that this Hogrekan region provides a corridor to the animals which pass from one region to another. So the third statement is correct. The fourth statement. It is composed of shola forests interspersed with grasslands. This is again correct. What are shola forests? So the name shola in itself is derived from the Tamil word sholai. And these are basically mountain forests which you end up finding in the southern region, in the region around Nilgiris, in the higher altitude. Even though the mountains, they are not very high as compared to the northern region of the country, but still you have many areas above 1000 meters. So in those areas, you have a different kinds of forest which end up growing and they are referred to as sholas. Okay? Typically, they are found in the region around Nilgiris, in the region around Silent Valley National Park. Those are the areas where you do find shola vegetation in abundance. So we have 1, 3 and 4 which is correct and 2 is incorrect. So that gives us the answer that is A. And this is the biodiversity heritage site that we are basically talking about. Now, moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements with reference to dugongs. Now what are dugongs? Dugongs are basically, as you can see, these are herbivorous marine mammals. And they are also referred to as sea cow, just because they are herbivorous and they graze on the plants and small grasses which appear on the continental shelf area very close to the coastline. Now, because of increased amount of poaching and also destruction of their natural habitat, these dugongs, many of the times, they became threatened. And that is why in the regions such as Gulf of Manar Biodiversity Reserve, all these areas, you had a special protection program going on to preserve these dugongs. They belong to the species that we refer to as manatees the larger group of manatees. So all of them are herbivorous and dugong is one type of that. Now let us take a look at the statements which are framed there. Now first, they have a long lifespan of around 70 years. This is correct. Please understand and always keep this in mind. They are marine herbivorous mammals. Okay? And these are the only few marine herbivorous mammals which are left out there in the world and that is why there is a need to protect them. The IUCN status for dugong is what? 
as per the IUCN status, dugongs belong to the category of the vulnerable group. Now, they are found in deeper waters and away from the shores. Now think about it. These are basically herbivores. They graze upon the various different plants and grasses which grow very close to the coastline. But also understand, herbivores and herbivorous animals generally, can they be found away from the coastal area in deeper waters? No. And why is that? Because when you go to the deeper waters there, the availability of sunlight suddenly decreases. And thereby, it is very, very difficult for plant species to grow in deeper waters in the first place. And that is why all these herbivorous animals, they will be found very close to the shoreline, very close to the continental shelf area in itself. And it is only in these continental shelf areas where you will have growth of vegetation, the growth of grasses and so on. So that is why they are not found in deeper waters, rather they are found in shallow waters or areas where the water is shallow. Okay, so this is going to be incorrect. Third is, it is a state animal for Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Now this is a kind of a factual statement. Oftentimes you find such factual statements appearing in the examination. Now in this case, either you know it or you don't know it. In case you did not know it till now, now you know it. So whenever you approach such factual questions in the examination, please do not take undue type of risk. If you know it, attempt it, otherwise simply ignore it. But yes, dugong is the state animal for Andaman Nicobar Islands. So that makes the third statement again to be correct. So we have to find out which of them are correct. So the answer shall be C, that is one and three only. Okay. Now, and dugongs always keep in mind, these are as of now, these are vulnerable. The area, the protected area where you will find them to be in increased quantity will be around the Pork Bay region, around the coastline of Tamil Nadu or in the Gulf of Manar. Biosphere Reserve. There you will find them to be in increased numbers and increased quantities, okay? So you know about this animal now, you know a part about their lifespan as well, and also you know about the IUCN status along with the protected area in India where you will find them. Now, after this, moving to the next question. Now, this is a passage-based question, and here, after reading the passage, you have to find out that which biosphere reserve is being talked about. So, it harbors a wide spectrum of ecosystems comprising tropical wet evergreen forests, mountain ranges reaching a height of around 642 meters above sea level, and also coastal plains. Now, this is the first bit of information that you have with you. Now, immediately after looking at this first bit of information, look at the various different options which are given in front of you. Now, here, of the various different biosphere reserves which are given here, look at them. Sundaban, Great Nicobar, Gulf of Manar and Kutch. Now, out of which of them do you think that they will have this whole spectrum and this wide gamut of ecosystem, including the tropical wet evergreen forest, along with the mountain ranges? So, mountain ranges won't be found in the region around Sundarban. You can eliminate that. Then, basically, mountain ranges to that particular height won't also be found in the region around Kutch. You can eliminate that as well. Let us suppose you are confused between Great Nicobar and Gulf of Manar. Let us see that if you can solve it with the help of additional information or not. By the way, here again, if you look at it, then tropical wet evergreen forest in itself is your biggest clue. Out of all the various different places given here, all the various biosphere reserves mentioned here, 
only one biosphere reserve will have tropical wet evergreen forest. Remember yesterday we had done a question regarding the distribution of tropical rainforest or tropical evergreen forest. And there we had talked about the fact that these tropical wet evergreen forests, they are found either in the western part of western Ghats or in the region around northeastern states or in the region around Andaman Nicobar Islands. Now of all the different options given here, only one of them satisfies that kind of information piece. So there you can reach at your or arrive at your answer. But nonetheless, more than 2000 species of plants and animals representing primitive to higher forms make it one of the richest coastal regions of India. The Mongoloid Shompen tribe, about 200 in number, live in the forests of the Biosphere Reserve, particularly along rivers and streams. So all these, they point out to the same biosphere reserve that we are talking about, and that is the Great Nicobar Biosphere Reserve. Now, along with these tribes, you also have another Mongoloid tribe which lives there, and that is the Nicobarese. So you have various different tribal groups also living in these protected areas. Many of the times you can also find questions whereby the statements shall be talking about that X, Y, Z or such and such tribes are to be found in these areas. So if you have a broader clue regarding, for example, where is it that you will find Torahs and so on, that will always help you reach closer to the answer with the help of the process of elimination. Okay, so keep that in mind while you are reading the protected areas and the protected area networks in general. So here the answer is Great Nicobar, that is B. And A, C and D, they are incorrect. Now, after this, the next question. Which of the following statements is correct with reference to Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve? Now, Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve it is a large area in the region to the southern part of Western Ghats and it encompasses through the states of Kerala, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. So it spans through all these three different states. So that is why it is very natural. It will have a wide variety of a vegetation as well and if it has got a wide variety of vegetation it will also have a wide variety of faunal structure or different types of animals can also be found here so mudumalai wildlife sanctuary and the silent valley protected areas are a part of the reserve this is actually true in this nilgiri biosphere reserve which is the largest protected area that you have so one of the largest protected areas here will be the Bandipur. Bandipur National Park. Other than that, you also have other protected areas in this region. For example, you have the Mudumalai. You also have the Vayanad. All these. And huge quantities and huge concentration of tiger population is found in this region. This region is drained by multiple different rivers, but then most of them are the tributaries of River Kaveri. So you have River Kabi Kabini being one of those major river streams, which ultimately goes on and meets with River Kaveri. But this River Kabini, it drains through this area around Mudumalai, Vayanad, and also the uh, region around Nagarhol Tiger Reserve. So in all these areas, you do have these streams and that is why the wildlife is very, very rich and biodiversity is also at the same time very diverse. So Nagarhol, Bandipur, Mudumalai, all of them, they lie in this region. It includes tropical thorn forests. Now, ideally, you can get confused here by looking at the fact that it is situated around the Western Ghats. How will it have a thorn forest in existence? Because for thorn forests to exist, the rainfall requirement is pretty less. 
the rainfall that is required should be ideally between 50 to 70 centimeter per year. That is the requirement for thorn forest. So do we have thorn forest around the region of Nilgiris? We do have, especially in the western part of Tamil Nadu, which is generally drier. And also in the leeward side of the western Ghats, immediate leeward side, there also in certain areas, you do have these tropical th thorn forests. And few of the areas, they have even degraded to form tropical scrubs. So that is where you do find tropical thorn forests in existence. What are the other areas where you find tropical thorn forests? You will find them in the region around Telangana, in the region around eastern part of Maharashtra. You will find them in existence in the region around Gujarat, in existence in the region around Rajasthan. These are the areas where you will find thorn forests in large quantities. Tamil Nadu, the region where it has got thorn forests, there the major problem which lies is the forest fires. When it gets very, very dry, especially during these months, you will always have few of the other instances of forest fires sparking there. So that is where thorn forest ecosystem is also very important there. Now, it is home to lion-tailed and bonnet macaques. Now, Lion-tailed macaque is an important species. Multiple times UPSC has asked a question regarding that. As of now, lion-tailed macaque, that is lying in the endangered category as per IUCN. As per IUCN, it lies in the endangered category. Okay. Their number seemed to be increasing a couple of years back, but again, there was a perceivable loss in population which was measured, and that is why they were again put under the endangered category. So in this case, yes, both of them are found, especially along the region of the Western Ghats, and that makes all the three statements to be correct. So here, the answer will be D, that is one, two, and three, all of them being correct. Correct. And this is the information regarding Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. So till now, we have looked at the Biosphere Reserve present in Great Nicobar. We have had some idea about the Biosphere Reserve in Gulf of Manar regarding dugongs, the existence and presence of dugongs, and also Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. So we have covered three different Biosphere Reserves till now. Now, moving on to the next question. Consider the following statements with reference to the clouded leopard. Now don't confuse it with the snow leopard out there. These are clouded leopards. As per IUCN status, these have been put under the category of being vulnerable. Okay? These are again, just like the other species or other feline species, these are again very solitary animals. So, it inhabits primary evergreen forests of Southeast Asia, which is correct, and is deemed to be possibly extinct in India. This portion is incorrect, making the whole statement incorrect. While it is true that it inhabits the primary evergreen rainforest, especially in the regions around Indonesia and also other portions of Southeast Asia, but then it is found all the way to the foothills of Himalayas. Wherever you have the low altitude evergreen forests, those are the ideal habitations for these different animals. So they end up existing in low altitude evergreen vegetation. In India, where are they found? They are found almost all along the Purvanchal hills or the eastern portion of the Himalayas. You will find them to be in existence across the foothills, wherever the rainfall is higher, thereby the vegetation is significant. Okay? So, in the region of Mizoram, for example, you will find them in very large quantities. In the region around Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, all these areas, the spotting of clouded leopard has been done they have been sighted there. Now, 
it is not to be found in higher elevations. This is again incorrect. Slightly higher elevations, they can be found there. It is not as if they will be found in plain areas along the sea level. In the region around Mizoram, for example, and also in Nagaland, they were found to be at an elevation of more than 1000 meter above sea level. So the statement is incorrect that they cannot be found in the region of high elevation. Anyways, if you know that they are found in the northeastern states along the mountainous areas, how is it that they, their limit will be restricted to the sea level? That is simply not possible. So the second statement is also incorrect. It is listed as a vulnerable species in the IUCN red list. Now this portion is correct. So the third statement is correct. And we have to find out which of them are incorrect. So we know that 1 and 2 are incorrect. So the answer shall be C, that is 1 and 2 only. Now, moving on to the next question, and this is the clouded leopard. Again, let me remind you and reiterate it that snow leopard and clouded leopard, both of them are different. So please do not end up confusing in their habitat or also in their living conditions and the regions where they are found in India. Now with reference to the recently declared Dehing Patkai National Park, consider the following statements. It is located in western Arunachal Pradesh. This statement is incorrect. Why? Because it is found where? It is found in the state of Assam. Right? That is where you will find them in existence. Now, it is drained by Dirak and Buri Dehing rivers. This is actually correct. Now, by the way, I know that if I know the state where it lies, so I know the first statement which is incorrect. Now, if the first statement is incorrect, all the options where one is given, eliminate that. Right? Automatically, you are left with the correct answer. By the way, this national park, which has been declared, makes it a total of seven national parks now in existence in the region of Assam, which is quite a significant number. And that makes Assam amongst few of those states which have more than five protected areas within their state boundaries. Now, it has the largest concentration of the rare white-winged wooden duck white-winged wooden duck. This is the white-winged wooden duck. As per the IUCN status, this again lies in endangered category as per the IUCN red list. Keep that in mind. Okay, so it has the largest concentration of the rare white-winged wooden duck. This statement will again be correct. It does include some sections of tropical wet evergreen forest. This is again correct. It lies almost in the eastern extent of Assam, right? In almost the easternmost extent of Assam, where you have the last remaining stretches of these tropical wet evergreen forests. Beyond that, you have a very few limited areas of these forests in existence. That is why in this region, you have more concentration of biodiversity, especially animals and faunal species. So that is why this area has been declared as a protected area. So this also is correct. So you have two, three and four, all of them being correct. So the answer is B. This is one of the latest and the recently declared protected areas, which makes it important for this year's exam. Now, as you can see, Assam now has seven national parks at Kaziranga, Manas, Nameri, Orang, Dibru Saikhova, Raimona and Dehing Patkai. Ideally, many of you will have this doubt that now that only a few days are left for the prelims, should we go ahead and start memorizing and rote learning all the national parks out there? The answer is no. You should never do that. 
because that will make or that will put in front of you a kind of a list that you shall never be able to revise as well. So with the help of these types of questions or these types of news headlines which brings to light certain national parks thereby with the help of that you can also have the associated reading of the other national parks in existence there. That can help you quite significantly. Okay, so do not go for endless reading and the endless study of all the national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. Go for state-wise demarcation if you really want to do so. But there also restrict yourself to only those protected areas which have been in relevance and which is in news and in discussion. Now, coming to the next question. With reference to Northern River Terrapin or Batagor Baska, Consider the following statements. Northern River Terrapin. Now the name in itself many of the times gives you very vital clues. But anyways, it is a freshwater fish found in estuarine ecosystems. This is incorrect. Why? Because Batagor Baska is a riverine turtle. It is not a fish. So it is a riverine species of turtle which exists only in freshwater ecosystem. Okay? Now, it is classified as critically endangered by IUCN which is correct. It is critically endangered as per the classification of IUCN. So that makes this important. Now why is it in news? Why are we discussing this? There are other critically endangered species as well. But we are discussing about Northern River Terrapin. Why is that? That is because a conservation program is being run in the Sundarban Tiger Reserve aimed at the protection of these species. This is actually correct. Now this conservation program has been operational for quite some time now. This conservation program has been in operation for the last 5 to 10 years. And thereby various different species of this terrapin along with the endangered ones they have been protected including the local community including and thereby soliciting the participation of the local community and then releasing them in the wild. So that is why in the region, especially around the Sundarbans and the Sundarbans Delta, there you have this riverine ecosystem, the freshwater ecosystem, there you find them in increased quantities and in increased numbers. So the third statement is also correct. And we have to find out which of the above statements is or are correct. Always make it a point to look at whether it is being asked to point out the correct statement or the incorrect statement. So here we have to find out the correct one. So the answer will be B. That is 2 and 3 only. Now in this case, what is it that you have to retain? What is it that you have to remember for the exam? The ecosystem, where they belong, the IUCN status, the region where they are to be found. Okay, so it is found across the riverine ecosystem, especially in the Gangetic and the Brahmaputra River basin. Now, the next question. Consider the following statements with reference to the Mura Drava Danube Biosphere Reserve. Now, very recently, UNESCO has declared this whole biosphere reserve to be a protected area. Now, what is special about this protected area that we are studying about it is the fact that it spans across five different countries. It is a first of a kind protected area whereby the cross country protection is being aimed at. It fits with the goal of the European Union to claim a greener future and for the protection of the species as well. But then here you have to understand that what are the various different countries which are involved here. So you have Austria, then you have Slovenia, Croatia, Hungary and Serbia, right? So Slovenia, 
Croatia, Serbia and Hungary. So across all these five different countries of Europe, you have this kind of ecosystem, the riverine ecosystem which is in existence and it has been declared a protected area. It is a kind of an epitome of the riverine ecosystem, the pristine e riverine ecosystem. It actually also does lie along the way of many different flyways that we talked about yesterday whereby the species they migrate from their home territory to any other region during the harsh winter conditions or during other seasons. So in many of these species, in many of their cases, they take a break along the waters of this riverine ecosystem. Now, the UNESCO has designated it as the world's first five country biosphere reserve. That is correct. And that is what makes it very, very important. Now, it now forms the largest protected area in Central Africa. This is in fact incorrect. Why? It is in Europe. It is not in Central Africa. But in Europe, this has now been deemed to be as the Amazon of Europe. So that is how it is being deemed and it has been touted as. It is also referred to as the Amazon of Europe. Basically, you have three different river systems. The Mura river system, the Drava river system and the Danube river system. All these three river systems, as they flow along the way, they end up making various different types of land features. The depositional land features that you have, including certain sandbars, certain riverine islands, and riverine islands, by the way, are always very, very important in terms of biodiversity and also in terms of the bird life. In India, you have one of the largest riverine islands across the globe. Can you recall the name of that? It is actually Majuli Island. Majuli Island. Where is it situated? It is situated in the Brahmaputra River Basin. And by the way, this Majuli Island has also been declared to be a biodiversity heritage site. So we have seen at Hograkan, along with that you also have Majuli Patal Court in Madhya Pradesh, all of them have been declared as the biodiversity heritage site. So that tells you about the importance of the riverine ecosystem. Riverine ecosystem, why it is so favored by the various different species? Because the rivers, when they come through, they bring about a wide variety of salts and minerals along with them. And at the same time, in these ecosystems, you will have an abundance of various different fishes and smaller animals which serve as the food and fodder. So that is why you have a quite a rich variety and quite a rich plethora of species living in such riverine ecosystems. So the reserve is a prime example of a riverine ecosystem consisting of oxbow lakes, riverine islands and also sand banks. This is correct. So, when we talk about birds and bird life, they will be found across the riverine islands and these sand banks that we are talking about. What are these sand banks, by the way? Many of the times you observe them as bars, as depositional features. So basically when the river, in its mature phase, sometimes in the later mature phase as well, when the speed of the river flow reduces quite significantly, all the sediments that the river has been carrying with it, those sediments the river is unable to bring along anymore and those sediments it starts dropping along its own course. Now when such deposition happens in a large and bulky manner, that can create a large riverine island out there. But then sometimes these depositions happen in such a way, something that you can observe even in the case of Indian rivers. Maybe if you have traveled across River Ganga, Godavari, Mahanadi, Krishna or even Kaveri, all these rivers, they do exhibit 
the property of having certain sandbars. Suppose this is the river flow. In many of the areas, you will have a kind of a deposit somewhat like this. During the rainy season, this will be again flooded by water and you won't be able to look at this sandbar deposit. But then again, come the dry season, the water level will go down, these areas will be exposed and that will provide a kind of a platform for the various different migratory birds that travel across larger distances. So 1 and 3 here are correct and that is the answer C. This is one of the most important questions that you will come across this year and here if you observe this is the river Mura, here you have the river Drava, right? And then both of them, they meet with river Danube. Okay, so the whole system has been given a kind of a protection. And look at this, the core zone for any protected area, the core zone is very, very important. Look at how the core zone basically extends all the way where the river is flowing, especially in the regions where you have a culmination and also the meeting point between the rivers, there the core zone is very significant, which tells you something about the ecosystem existing in those regions. Now, coming to the next question. So, it is a species of least concern as per IUCN classification but lies under Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. In the past six years, its population has almost doubled in the state of Odisha. It is this particular fact which makes this species a bit important this year. Bishnoi community is known world over for the conservation efforts extended to this species. It is the state animal of not one state, but then Haryana, Punjab, and also Andhra Pradesh. Which of the following species is described in the passage given above? So this species is that of a least concern as per IUCN status. But in India, their numbers have been declining quite significantly and quite rapidly. And that is why these species were put under immense kind of protection and that is why they lie in schedule one of the wildlife protection act as well so if you take a look at it then bishnoi community where is it that you will find the bishnoi community you will find them where rajasthan right you'll find them in rajasthan so which species are we talking about we are talking about black buck. Black buck, their number has suddenly started increasing in the region of Odisha, especially the southern part of Odisha. Now, this is a kind of a species or a variety of antelopes out there. Now, these black bucks, if you look at it, they were being poached for their very unique antler shape that they had and also their glistening skin, which then later on after being hunted with the help of taxonomy thereby they could be served as the trophies out there in the jungle. So that is why they have been poached incessantly for a very large amount of time and only after due protection now their number has started increasing. Bishnoi community in fact made a name out of the conservation of these species and they are very particular about conserving these species. So here you have to know what is the IUCN status and in which part of the Wildlife Protection Act does this lie. So it lies in Schedule 1 indicating maximum protection out there. Now, consider the following statements with reference to riverine dolphins. Now again, riverine dolphins, they are to be found across the world. But then their number has been declining steadily. Why? As you can guess, because the flow of the river water is being altered at the same time. We also have huge amount of pollution which is being carried out in that riverine ecosystem which makes it extremely difficult for these dolphins to survive. 
By the way, these riverine dolphins mostly, they are blind. Now, depending upon which river of the world are you talking about, you have different species of riverine dolphins to be found. All of them have got their own unique name which has been ascribed to them. For example, you will find a different riverine dolphin to be in existence in the region of Amazon. Even in the river Indus or the Indus river basin, you will find a different species of riverine dolphin. In the Ganga river basin, you will find different species and so on. So their species subtype also keeps on varying from one ecosystem to another one. Now their protection is very vital. Why? Because they form a very important part of this food chain in the river or the aquatic ecosystem. So, it is an indicator species of the health of river ecosystem. This is correct. Indicator species means that gives you an idea about the amount of pollution which is being carried out in the rivers out there. That gives you a fair idea about it. Now, Project Dolphin is a 10-year project which has been launched for the protection of these species. This is again correct. We'll look at Project Dolphin in a moment. Now, Vikram Shila Gangetic Dolphin Sanctuary is India's first dolphin observatory which has been established in Uttar Pradesh to conserve the river dolphins. While for most of this part, the statement is correct, it is only the location which makes this statement incorrect. Why? Where is Vikram Shila Gangetic Dolphin Sanctuary situated? It is actually situated in the lower stream of River Ganga in the district of Bhagalpur. Where? In the part of Bihar. More particularly so, eastern part of Bihar, there you have the dolphin sanctuary which has been made in order to conserve them. So that is why this statement is incorrect and we have to find out which of them are correct. So the answer shall be A, 1 and 2 only. Now here please keep one thing in mind. This is also something which has been in news, which has been in relevance for geography as well. Because in geography you would have read about the part of interlinking of rivers. Now one of the biggest criticism which comes to the way of interlinking of rivers is that if you mix different riverine waters and different waters coming from different ecosystems, thereby you are polluting the waters where these dolphins thrive. And that is why interlinking should not be done. This is one of the biggest criticism which comes to the way. But then at the same time, you have to keep in mind that you have a model for protection of these species. And this is an in situ model. It is not as if you are taking these dolphins out from the Ganga River system and protecting them out there in the Chambal Basin. You are protecting them within the waters of River Ganga itself. It is just about the process of conservation. So in order to conserve these dolphins, there are few things which need to be done. And few of the areas which need to be monitored. First is the river pollution or the level of pollution. That has to be brought under control. And secondly, what another thing we have to bring in control is the huge amount of siltation. Huge amount of siltation. Now, as there have been rampant constructions going on on both sides of the river channel across the country, it is not only restricted to River Ganga, thereby the rivers, the silt and all the small sedimentary particles that they are bringing, they are keeping on depositing them in the river channel itself, thereby the river is becoming much more shallower. And these dolphins, they do require some amount of deeper waters. These dolphins, they cannot see. They do not have their eyesight. It is only with the help of sound waves and echolocation that they are able to look at the obstacles that lie in front of them. So for that, some amount of depth of water is very much required for them to be navigating easily. Now, because of navigation which has started and which has been initiated in the National Waterway 1, which exists from where? From Allahabad to Hooghly. So, the National Waterway 1, which passes through the region of Bhagalpur in Bihar, 
Thereby, the ships are also now moving across these river channels, which can serve as a hindrance for these riverine dolphins because now the sounds that they emit, they can be reflected by the sonar devices which the ships are carrying. So again, inland navigation is another one of those factors which have to be taken care of while caring for these dolphins. You have to ensure that there is no rampant kind of navigation, inland navigational activities which are going on. So if you take a look at this project Dolphin, it is basically a 10 year project. And this is not restricted only to riverine dolphins. From here again, one statement can be framed that this project deals with only riverine dolphins. And that is where you have to understand that it is for both river and sea dolphins out there. Its aim is to strengthen the biodiversity and attract tourism and thereby also the various different restrictions which are being put into the river channels. Restrictions in terms of what? In terms of construction of dams, in terms of construction of barrages out there, all these different types of restrictions, what do they do? They limit and inhibit the flow of the river, right? flow of river. So the flow of the river has to be unhindered. If you construct endless number of barrages and storage structures and dams within the river course, while it can help you store maximum amount of water, make maximum utilization of water, but water will almost become stagnant. And that starts making the water a bit saline because what happens when water becomes slightly stagnant, the amount of evaporation suddenly and exponentially increases, which makes the water ecosystem to be saline. And that will be devastating and disastrous for these species. Okay. Now, Ganges River Dolphin, a species of this freshwater dolphin, that is something which is found in River Ganga, River Brahmaputra and all these basins all the way to the region of West Bengal and also some parts of Bangladesh. And these are the states where they are found. Okay. It is not restricted to only one particular state. All these states are where you can find these Gangetic Dolphins and Riverine Dolphins in existence. The Gangetic River Dolphin is also ascribed a name which is referred to as SOS and is spelled as S-U-S-U, -S -U. okay? Now, moving on to the next question. Consider the following passage. Such species play a major role in creating or maintaining a habitat. So, they are very important in creating the habitat in the first place. So they are the kind of creators, okay? They determine local and regional biodiversity, control ecosystem dynamics, and have intrinsic value to the people who live with or near them. They are numerically abundant and account for most of the biomass in an ecosystem. Now, which species are we talking about? So basically, Indicator species, flagship species, foundation species, keystone species, these have been in relevance almost every year. Why? Because as we go ahead to conserve the various different ecosystems and the species biodiversity, we have to understand the role that each and every animal, each and every species plays in the larger biodiversity management. So when we talk about such kind of ecosystem, we are talking about which kind of species? We are talking about foundation species. The name in itself tells you, foundation, they have a major role in creating the kind of a habitat, creating and maintaining a habitat. Example, example of foundation species can be corals. How? Now suppose, in any marine or aquatic ecosystem where the water is shallow, water is not very deep. Now in those areas, availability of small amount of sunlight is there. 
if corals they start thriving in that region, thereby algal growth will also be there, zooxanthellae, not the harmful algal bloom that we talked about, the growth of the useful algae. Now thereby, when they have grown quite substantially and significantly, then what will happen? They shall start supporting numerically larger number of species of fishes and also other aquatic animals. At the same time, these corals that they grow, they can also serve the purposes for tourism activities as well as the algal growth in the form of zooxanthellae that has got very useful medicinal use. So that is why it brings to use a kind of an intrinsic value to the people who live in that region. It can be exploited as well and it can be brought to sustainable use as well. So that is why they are referred to as foundation species. But then very quickly let us recap what the other different types of species are starting with the indicator species. Now when we talk about indicator species, we have already dealt with multiple questions dealing with indicator species. So I don't think we need to delve much amount of time here. But just to give you a brief recap and a brief idea about it. So basically those species which give you an idea about the type of pollution or the amount of pollution which has taken place. Whether the ecosystem is in its pristine form or whether it is now being disturbed. So examples include crayfish, right? for the fresh water quality. Corals can also act as indicators and corals can also be acting as foundation species. So you have various different species which can act as indicator species and they give you an idea about the ecosystem, the health of the ecosystem. Lichens, quite significantly so, are used as an indicator species to give you an idea about the um, quality of air which is present or prevalent in the region where they are growing. If the air is very pristine, very pure, you will have more growth of lichens. Otherwise, these lichens, they will start reducing in their population, in their numbers. Okay? Now, then you have the keystone species. The keystone species are those who form a very important part, a substantial part in the existence of the whole food web across that ecosystem. For example, when we talk about, let's say, elephants, as the figure here gives you an idea. Now, these elephants, they have a very vital role to play in the grassland ecosystem, especially the tropical savanna ecosystem. So, elephants, for example, Elephants have a very ro important role to play in the tropical savanna. How and why? Because when we talk about tropical savanna, here you have large areas of grasslands dotted with few trees here and there. So, in those areas, it is the grazing which is done by these elephants which helps in actually limiting the growth of grass beyond a certain level. But at the same time, these elephants also play a very vital role in distributing the seeds, the flowering plants, etc. and thereby ensuring a widespread growth and widespread distribution and a further propagation of generation of the various floral species as well. So these kinds of species, such kinds of species, which play a very vital role in ensuring the sustenance and thriving of the whole ecosystem in general, that is referred to as a keystone. Many of the times, apex predators in certain ecosystem, they also serve as a keystone species. Because if those apex predators, they don't exist, for example, you have tigers in certain cases, leopards in certain cases, then the smaller floral and faunal species, they start growing incessantly and the whole balance goes haywire. One of the cases which has been observed in this is the case of the invasive alien species in the form of the Burmese python and how it has basically invaded the whole region around Florida. Now, because of the lack of an apex predator there, the whole balance of the ecosystem has been destroyed there. So, this is the importance of keystone species. 
then we have flagship species. Flagship as the name in itself tells you, this gives you an idea or this gives you a larger message out there. For example, it is a species selected to act as an ambassador, icon or symbol for any kind of defined habitat, issue, campaign or environmental cause. For example, if you take a look at the, pa uh, at the pandas out there and also koala bears, all of them, they serve as the vital mascot ensuring the protection of animals. So that also becomes very, very important. These flagship species, they are important to serve a larger message out there. For example, Bengal tiger. Now the tiger population has started increasing, but for a long period of time in the past decade, the tiger population was dwindling like anything. So in those cases, in those situations, these kinds of species are very, very important to raise the awareness of the public and also to ensure a large scale community participation, which is very, very vital for ensuring the safety of any ecosystem out there. And then we have the foundation species that we have talked about and they play a major role in creating the habitat. And corals, they are a key example. So across many islands of South Pacific Ocean, you will find that in fact you have many islands which have a coral origin, even Lakshadweep in India. Many islands in the region around Maldives, you have these islands created as a result of the coral ecosystem. So how is it that these islands have come into existence? Over a period of time as the corals, they start growing on top of each other, eventually they rise above the low tide level themselves and that becomes the bulwark or the base for creation of a new island itself. And then the island can have many different varieties of species living there. But then the foundation has been created by corals. So corals here you get an example of the same species serving to be an indicator species but along with being an indicator species, they can also be deemed to be a kind of a foundation species out there. So here, the coral islands again are very, very important. You have to understand how they are created, even though this is something which is generally asked in the mains examination, but then sometimes you can also have a connotation in the prelims part as well. So how are they created? One after the other. How do the corals, they rise in height? How does their height increase in the first place? So that happens based upon the base of calcium carbonate that the previous generation of corals would have left behind. So every generation of coral, let's say they have grown here and this is the level of water. So slowly and steadily, you will have more further growth of corals and when this generation will die, they will leave behind the calcium carbonate exoskeleton. Again, the fresh corals and the fresh generations will use that as the base for their growth. Eventually, they will start rising above. The moment they rise above the low tide level, at that point of time, the corals in this region, they will simply die. And that is how you have creation of smaller islands, Lakshadweep. Maldives, many parts and many smaller islands in the Polynesia and Micronesia region of South Pacific, they owe their origin to corals, okay? So the rocky exoskeletons of these polyps create enormous structures around islands and you have coral reefs. Three types of coral reefs are in existence. What are they? You have fringing, fringing reefs, then you have the barrier reefs and then you have the atolls. So these are the three different landscapes which the corals end up creating and all of them they are going to be very very rich in biodiversity. Fringing reef is something you find along the coastline right so for example, the coral reefs that you find across the coastal area of the peninsular part of the country, they will come under the category of fringing reefs. 
Now, for example, when we talk about the Great Barrier Reef in the eastern part of Australia, that comes under the category of the barrier reefs, whereby some amount of water exists between the corals and the mainland. Atolls are pure island creation, very, very rich in marine biodiversity. Various different types of herbivorous as well as carnivorous marine animals you can find in the region around atolls. Now, Consider the following statements with reference to the lesser florican recently seen in the news. Now, why has this been recently in news? By the way, this lesser florican, it lies in the category of critically endangered. Okay, keep that in mind. Lesser florican, now, it is very, very small in size. And it is particularly known if you have looked at the various different documentaries out there or even if you have actually traveled to the forested areas or uh, the landscapes of grasslands, especially during the rainy season, these are known particularly for their dance. On the arrival of monsoon rains, they have a very elaborate dance pattern and that is what makes them very, very famous even though their size is particularly small. This is the lesser florican that you know of. Now, it is to be found in India only in the arid and semi-arid locations of Rajasthan and Gujarat. Now, remember yesterday I told you that whenever you come across such absolute words, only, always, never, neither, there are chances that such statements will be incorrect. Here again, such state, this statement is incorrect. Why? Because it is found almost all across the country. Wherever you have slightly arid to semi-arid uh, conditions, even in the conditions of having lush grasslands, there also you will find these lesser floricans to be in existence. They thrive and mate particularly well during the monsoon season, especially the onset of monsoon rains. And that is when they have their very unique chirp as well as their unique dance style which is ascribed to them. Reclamation of dry lands into agricultural lands is turning out to be one of the major causes for its decline in population. This is correct. Across the country, when you take a look at it, we are reclaiming more and more lands for agriculture, right? In order to improve the agricultural productivity, even the remotest areas of the country there, the people are now engaging in the agricultural activities, bringing the forested areas, the grassland areas, the dry land areas, all of them. So various species such as this little florican, along with various different other species that we'll talk about, they are getting threatened. So agricultural activity is one of the major causes of the destruction of landscape. And also keep this in mind, many of the times we think that it is only lumbering activity and destruction of forest by wood cutting, which is destroying the landscapes. Actually, it is agriculture, which plays a major role across the globe in destruction of pristine ecosystems. Even in the Northeastern states, the rate of deforestation is incredibly high, probably almost amongst the highest across the country agriculture has got a major role to play. Destruction of mangrove ecosystem, agriculture has got a role to play. So almost in each and every ecosystem, agriculture has got a role to play. Okay, so here, second part is correct, first is incorrect. We have to find out which of the statements given above is or are incorrect. So the answer here shall be A, that is one only. Here you have to keep in mind, this belongs to the same larger species that we have when we talk about the great Indian bustard, for example, right? So the larger species is the same. This is just a subgenus of that, okay? It is critically endangered. Where is it found in India? Almost across the country. You will find them in existence in Madhya Pradesh, in the region of Gujarat, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand. Nowadays in Jharkhand and West Bengal, 
the existence of such ecosystems are very very limited so that is why their numbers are very very less even earlier they used to be found in the region around Odisha but now there again their sighting has reduced quite considerably okay now consider the following statements with reference to the blue finned mahasir recently seen in the news now it has recently been listed by IUCN as a critically endangered species. What is blue finned mahasir? It is a kind of a fish. Now, it has recently been listed by IUCN as a critically endangered species. This is incorrect. Why? Earlier, these species were threatened. But because of, and they were vulnerable as well. But then, because of increased efforts by various different groups, various different institutions as well, and NGOs, their numbers have increased quite substantially and rapidly for that matter, as is the case with the fish population. Now, they lie in the category of least concern. Okay? Now, they lie in the category of least concern. Now, it is an important indicator of freshwater ecosystem. That is again correct. So, if the water in the rivers or wherever it is in existence, if the water is impure, if it is carrying too much amount of mud, too much amount of sediment, it is very murky or there has been pollution, these fishes, they start dying in large numbers. So, this is correct. They are an indicator. Third, they thrive in lentic ecosystems like lakes and ponds. Now, yesterday we talked about the lentic and lotic ecosystem. Lentic ecosystem refers to the freshwater ecosystem where water is stagnant, right? For example, you have a few of the bogs, lakes, ponds, etc. Lotic ecosystem refers to the fast flowing freshwater ecosystem such as rivers, streams, runoffs, etc. So, these fishes, they are not to be found in lentic ecosystem, rather they are found in lotic ecosystem or fast flowing river streams. That is where you will find these species in existence. So here we have to find out which of the statements is or are correct. So the correct answer in this case will be B that is two only and that is the correct option. Now consider the following statement with reference to gharials found in India. Now in this particular session we are covering the different species which have been in news for some reason or the other. So typically you will find the same pattern of questions out there, but it is the information within the statements and the question in itself that you have to grab and that will serve as your process of revision. Okay, I'm sure that you would have repeated the same processes along the other subjects as well. And in the following classes, again, we shall be repeating the same thing so that you get an ample opportunity to have revised all of them and to be able to recall at the time of examination. Having said that, if you are following these sessions, please ensure that you are regular in them and click the bell icon to receive the notification when the next session is going to start. And if you have liked the video or liked the session, you know what to do and also leave us comments in the comment section regarding your experience. But anyways, first statement, these are categorized as critically endangered under the International Union for Conservation of Nation or Nature Red List, IUCN Red List. It has been listed as critically endangered. This is correct. Their numbers have been dwindling quite significantly and quite rapidly. At one point of time, almost across all the various different rivers, you could find gharials in our country. But then now, they have started disappearing quite rapidly, not only across the regions of the where you have larger population, but due to river pollution, their numbers have dwindled in other river basins as well. 
Brahmaputra river basin where they used to be in abundance at one point of time. Now the Assam government is planning to reintroduce the Gharial population in the Brahmaputra river basin. That is why this has been in news along with the fact that Odisha government has come up with a cash reward remuneration kind of a model to ensure their growth and their population increase across the Mahanadi river basin. Okay. Now, they live in clear freshwater ecosystem. This is again correct. They belong to the species of alligators, by the way. But then the difference between gharials and the normal different alligator or crocodile or mugger that you have is their snout, their elongated snout, which is there. And that is why these are the ones who depend upon the existence of small fishes in the river for their diet. And if their river is polluted, small fishes, they don't exist in large numbers. So that is why their population in itself started dwindling and started declining. These are those species of alligators. Ideally, they are weakest in terms of genetics across all the different alligator species. That is why they are so prone to being threatened out there. But then they have the ability to regulate their body temperature by staying out and exposing themselves to the outside environment or going underwater. And that is why they are slightly more resilient than the other species. But as compared to the genus of crocodiles, they are having a very weak sustenance and resistance. Satkoshia Gorge Sanctuary across River Chambal houses one of their largest populations. Now, here, River Chambal is the one which is incorrect. Satkoshia Gorge Sanctuary does have very large numbers of gharials in protection. But then it is not situated across River Chambal. It is actually situated in Odisha across River Mahanadi. Okay, that is something you have to keep in mind. Odisha, where? Across River Mahanadi. So the third statement is going to be incorrect. And we have to find out which of these statements are correct. So the answer in this case will be C. That is 1 and 2 only. Now this is in news because of the simultaneous efforts made by Odisha government as well as the Assam government. So keep that in mind. That makes it important. Now with reference to conservation's assured tiger standard or cats, consider the following statement. Now, what is this conservation assured tiger standards? This is like a standard operating procedure, so to say, in a very simple layman term. Because it was realized that everybody across the globe was talking about conservation of tigers. They had various different goals that they set for themselves, for others as well. But in each and every place, the process of conservation which was being carried out was not adequate enough. So while in certain places, in certain conditions, conservation effort was going on particularly well, other areas, the conditionality of availability of, let's say, water pools, the availability of smaller animals to serve as food for these tigers, all of them have to be catered for. And that is why CAT's system was basically incorporated so as to understand and give a kind of an accreditation to the protected areas and to the tiger reserves to ensure the best quality of maintenance and protection in order to increase the population of tigers. So that is where this CATS system comes into existence from. Now, all the tiger reserves in India have been accredited with CATS. This is incorrect. Right? As I said, whenever you have absolute terms, all, always, never, only, chances are they are incorrect. So here, why is it incorrect? Because recently, out of 51 tiger reserves out there, 14 were accredited with the CATS standards. Right? And this was done by National Tiger Conservation Authority. That is the apex body here. Now, the first statement is incorrect. Now, look at the options given here. Wherever you have option 1, we know that option 1 is incorrect. Eliminate that. Now, 
maximum number of cats accredited tiger reserves lie in the state of Madhya Pradesh. This is correct. How many? Four. We'll look at the list as well. Global Tiger Forum which is a global NGO and WWF India are the implementing partners of the National Tiger Conservation Authority for cats assessment in India. This is a correct statement. So it is not as if the NTCA in its own and randomly will start giving the accreditation to anyone and every protected area. The work, the preliminary work, the background check is carried out by WWF India and also GTF. Both of them, when they carry out the works, they carry out the checks and see that all the necessary parameters have been met, only then accreditation has been given. It has been given to only 14 as of now. So the third statement is correct. Second statement is correct. That makes B2 and 3 only to be the correct statement. Here, if you take a look at it, basically, these are the 14 reserves out there. Now, three of them lie in Assam, one in West Bengal, one in Bihar, even though here the population is almost negligible. In the Valmiki Tiger Reserve in Bihar, the population of tigers have dwindled so significantly, it is almost negligible now. Then you have Dodwa in Uttar Pradesh, Panna, Kanha, Satpura and Pech in Madhya Pradesh, Anamalai and Mudumalai in Tamil Nadu, Parambikulam in Kerala and Bandipur in Karnataka, all of them have been accredited with CATS standard. And that is something you should know about each one of them. This is something that you should know. Because ideally, what can be done, and here Panna Tiger Reserve is the one which is going to be in relevance. Why? Because of the interlinking of river which is being carried out that is the Kane betwa interlinking which has been carried out, thereby Panna Tiger Reserve is the one which has been in news because significant portions of this Tiger Reserve, they are on the verge of getting submerged there. So when such kinds of uh, protected areas, they figure out in the news headlines, you should know about the details of those protected areas. So you should know that Panna has been accredited with the CATS standard. Okay, so that is how you basically manage to stay a step ahead of the expectation of the examiner rather than simply chasing the questions which were asked earlier. Panna Tiger Reserve, again I will reiterate, is going to be important. Now, with reference to the great Indian bustard, which of the following statements are correct? Great Indian Bustard, again, another one of those births which have been in relevance continuously for the past couple of years. So, it is the state bird of Rajasthan, very, very correct. It is strictly herbivorous and can be found only in lush grassland ecosystem. Again, an absolute word out there, incorrect. And here, it is incorrect why it is not strictly herbivorous. Rather, when you talk about the Great Indian Bustard, it is considered to be one of the most opportunistic, uh, opportunistic species out there. It can feed on uh, the grasses as well and seeds as well, but at the same time, it feeds on very small animals as well. So it lies in the category of being omnivorous. Owing to its large size, it has flightless lifespan. This again is incorrect. It can fly. It is not flightless. But yes, it has got a very large size. It is listed as critically endangered on the IUCN red list. This portion is correct. It is critically endangered. So here you have one which is correct and four which is correct. So we had to find out the correct statements and that will be D. That is one and four only. Two and three are incorrect. Where are these great Indian bustards found? They are found especially in the region around Rajasthan and Gujarat. In Gujarat, particularly along the Vedavalar protected area, their population is quite significant and that is where it is rising. They belong to the larger subgenus or the larger genus of Hubaras as well. Hubaras are again the birds that you find in the region around 
Iran and also parts of Balochistan. This great Indian buster you will also find to be in existence across the Thar region of Pakistan as well. Okay, so across the whole northwestern part of the country, along with some parts of Pakistan, you find this great Indian bustard to be in existence. Now, consider the following statement with reference to the red sanders. Now, red sanders, it was very much in news for the past four to five years, but then due to protection, the actual existence and their population of red sanders that started increasing. Why was it in news? Because of smuggling activities. These are the types of trees which you end up finding in large quantities growing in the region around Andhra Pradesh. Now these trees have got a very unique kind of the wooden structure in itself where sometimes you will find certain layers in existence but at the same time it is their unique reddish appearance which makes them under so much demand. So much so that one ton of this wood of this red sanders can fetch you close to around 50 lakh to even one crore out in the international market. So that is why smuggling activities of these red sanders they were on the rise and that is when utmost prohibition and utmost protection was extended to red sanders. And during that time, UPSC had asked this question about red sanders, asked one question about red sanders at that point of time. Now again what happened is that in the past three to four years, as their numbers started increasing, then the government came out with a ruling that if these red sanders are cultivated, those cultivated red sanders can be exported legally out there. So the inhibition, the prohibition to export everything, that was actually relaxed. But recently, it was again found out that their numbers are dwindling, particularly in the region of Andhra Pradesh. And that is where, again, they have been put under the endangered category. Overall, you have to understand why in the region around Andhra Pradesh so much prohibition or so much protection is being extended. Because these are the trees which ideally grow up in areas where the rainfall is not very high. Rainfall is approximately in the range of around 90 to 100 centimeter per year. In those areas, red sanders, these trees, they start thriving. And they form a very important part of the ecological landscape. If the rampant and the kind of uh, endless cutting of these trees and their smuggling is carried out, that can lead to a widespread deforestation in the already existent dry areas of Andhra Pradesh and also parts of Telangana. So that is why it has been clamped down. Now, it is a tropical moist deciduous forest. This statement is incorrect. Why? It is not a tropical moist deciduous forest. It is basically a tropical dry deciduous forest. Okay? So, the first statement is incorrect. It is used to manufacture musical instruments. This is correct. And this is one of the reasons why it is smuggled to countries such as Japan. In Japan, you have increased demand of red sanders because of the acoustic property of the wood. Certain types of red sanders, not all and every variety of red sanders out there. Only certain types of these red sanders, they have very good acoustic qualities and that is why they are in great demand, especially in the region around Japan. So this statement is correct. Then it is listed as endangered under the IUCN red list or conservation for nature red list. It is listed as endangered. This portion is again correct, right? So you have first statement which is incorrect. Why? Because it is a dry deciduous. It is not a moist deciduous. So which of the above statements is or are correct? You have two and three. That is C. Ideally, what you should know about red sanders and you should know about red sanders is the fact about the rainfall requirement. Ideally, around 80 to 100 centimeters of rain is required. 
the region where they can be found along the eastern ghats they are endemic to the region around eastern ghats endemic to eastern ghats more particularly so in the region around andhra pradesh okay and you should also be knowing about the endangered listing of this red sanders as per the iucn red list now it has a plain rufous coat that camouflages it in sandy scrubby vegetation the wild cat has long legs a short face long canine teeth and distinctive ears which are long and pointy essentially an animal of dry regions it has a wide habitat tolerance and is widely distributed in india it has traditionally been valued for its extraordinary ability to catch birds mid flight that is how high they can actually end up jumping it is included in the list of critically endangered species in india so which of the following species is described in the passage given above african wild dogs no leopard carousel and florida panther if you look at this immediately here you have a biggest hint it is a wild cat so african wild dogs they simply are thrown out of the window here the answer shall be c that is carousel carousel they are a very unique variety of wild cat which generally exist in the region around scrubland semi arid areas and they basically again just like the case of normal other feline species they uh, prefer a life of solitary uh, habitation and they live life alone and they hunt especially at night them being nocturnal and they have a kind of an ability to jump very high almost up to 3 meters from the ground so they have very very strong hind legs which again makes them very special in india where they are found so they are found in the region around madhya pradesh western part of madhya pradesh and parts of rajasthan for a long period of time these feline species they used to serve as multiple purposes multiple roles even in certain cases as exotic pets but their numbers dwindled quite significantly in india however they are found across the regions of the central asia that is the region around the southern part of central asia so to say in the region around iran in some parts of pakistan you will also find them to be in existence to the west of iran you will also find them to be in existence across africa so their existence is widespread it is only in india where their numbers are quite low okay now next question with reference to the kelp forests consider the following statements now kelps are a dense population of algae which thrive in tropical waters and can grow up to 45 cm in one day these are the kelp forests that you see under water right the long plants that you see now they can be very very long in their height and their growth is also quite substantial but then at the same time they are nothing but algae so if you take a look at the first statement is the first statement correct it is actually incorrect why because they are not to be found in tropical waters they are found in colder waters colder waters away from tropics this is the reason why you will find kelp forests especially across the higher latitude regions and as the sea temperature is increasing and rising day by day due to global warming and climate change we know that the sea temperature is and the water temperature is rising ocean temperature is rising across the globe so that is where their habitations are now getting restricted and limited while at one point of time they existed even in the region around 40 degree north latitude now 
they have started shifting further north because even around 40 degree north latitude, there you have warmer waters now because of rising ocean temperature. So with global warming, this population is under increased threat. Okay, which ocean is there where you find the maximum concentration of kelp? Generally, you will find some part across the globe, but generally across the region around Atlantic and that too, the Northern Atlantic is where you will find them to be in predominance. Okay, so here the first statement is incorrect. Why? Because of tropical waters. Now, they require deeper waters and are always found away from the shores. Here again, use the same logic that we applied in the case of dugongs. Now, for these kelps to grow, you do need availability of sunshine and sunlight out there. Now, if the sunlight is not there, can they grow quite significantly? No. And in the deeper waters and away from the shores in the lower region, you don't have the availability of sunlight. That is why those areas in the deeper water where sunlight is not available, they are also what are referred to as the aphotic zones. Aphotic zones are the ones where growth of such species and plant species is highly restricted. It is highly limited. So that is why they will always grow very close to the shore in the continental shelf area. They will always grow in the continental shelf area. Keep that in mind. Right? Where you have shallow waters. So, the second statement also becomes incorrect. Now, sea otters help kelps to grow large enough to form forests. Now, this is a kind of an induced statement. You have to understand, ideally, when these kelps grow, you have certain restrictions imposed on them in the form of what? In the form of sea urchins. Sea urchins. Now these sea urchins, they start consuming these algae at the very base. And that is when they start, the forest starts dwindling and the whole area starts becoming barren underwater. It is like a kind of a de or desertification or deforestation of this landscape. But then these sea urchins, their population, it starts multiplying and that can be a devastating consequence for the kelp forest. But then sea otters, they serve as a limiting factor on these sea urchins. They consume these sea urchins in large quantities and that is when they regulate their population, thereby ensuring that the kelps, they grow large enough and they become dense enough to form a dense and a thick forest. So this statement shall be correct. Okay. Which of these statements given above are incorrect? So we have one and two only, which is going to be incorrect. Okay. Now, here always keep in mind about sea urchins and sea otters. Urchins are the ones which will reduce the span of the forest, the expanse of the forest. Otters, they feed on these urchins and thereby they ensure that these forests, they continue to thrive in numbers. Now, recently, the National Tiger Conservation Authority, NTCA, has designated this protected area to be a tiger reserve, which was originally part of the Sanjay Dhubri National Park, making it the fourth tiger reserve in the state of Chhattisgarh. Here itself, you can find your answer. But anyways, the reserve is located in the state's northernmost region, bordering Madhya Pradesh and Jharkhand, and was the country's last known habitat for the Asiatic cheetah. So, look at which of the following protected areas is described in the passage given above. You have the various protected areas. Now, out of all these protected areas, 
if you are even slightly aware of the protected area network out there, you would be able to figure out that Indravati, Uddanti, Sita Nadi and Tadoba, all of them are in existence from before. So recently, it was declared as a tiger reserve. So here, if you consider, let's say, the fact that this makes it the fourth tiger reserve in Chhattisgarh, just look at this. Indravati, where does it lie? It lies in the state of Chhattisgarh. River Indravati, which is a left bank tributary of River Godavari, drains through this area. Udanti Sita Nadi, that again lies in Chhattisgarh. Tadoba Andhari, where does it lie? It lies in the state of Maharashtra. Right? So eliminate this. The correct answer will be Guru Ghasidas Tiger Reserve. What is the other or the fourth Tiger Reserve? This is the latest one. What are the other three? One is Indravati, one is Udanti Sita Nadi, other is the Achanakamar Amar Kantak. That is also a Tiger Reserve. So now Chhattisgarh has got four different Tiger Reserves. Okay? So this is how you can relate to the new protected areas being created. Now, the newly proposed Lemru Elephant Reserve to reduce man-elephant conflict is located in which state? Now, Lemru Elephant Reserve, it has been in proposal for some time now. Recently, the area demarcation is being carried out. While earlier, it was proposed to be set up in, an, in a vast and expansive area close to around 1940 square kilometer, that has been reduced almost to a third of its size. It is to reduce the man-animal conflict, especially the elephants, when they barge into the villages and thereby they cause rampant destruction, but at the same time creates a hostility and also agricultural lands being extended to areas which ideally serve as elephant habitats. In order to reduce that, in order to remove that, this elephant reserve is being built around the Korba district. Korba district where? Again, in the state of Chhattisgarh. So, this is the latest elephant reserve which is being created and that is being created in the state of Chhattisgarh. Okay? Now, again, a passage type of question. Once the private hunting ground for the Maharajas of Mysore, this national park was formed by including the areas of erstwhile Venugopal Wildlife Park. It was brought under Project Tiger in 1973, very initially. It is also home to species like gaur, mouse deer, sloth bear and Malabar squirrel. Together with Mudumalai Wildlife Sanctuary and Vayanard Wildlife Sanctuary, it constitutes the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. This area has the river Kabini in its north and river Moyar in its south. Which national park is being talked about here? So once the private hunting ground for the Maharajas of Mysore, it has to be situated very close to that area. So this is basically the Bandipur National Park that we are talking about. In the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve, we have already talked about the fact that it is the Bandipur National Park which occupies one of the largest areas out there. So that is why this again becomes important. What you have to understand and what you can catch from here is the rivers which drain this area and which are the wildlife sanctuaries which together make up the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. That is what you can extract even from this particular question out there. Okay? Now, with reference to sociable lapwing, consider the following statements. Sociable lapwing, what is it? It is a kind of a bird. Now, this bird typically used to be in large quantities existent across the whole of the region of Central Asia. That is the region around Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and so on. There you had these birds in very large quantities. But then, slowly and steadily, their numbers, they started dwindling, their numbers that started declining quite rapidly. So, 
they have been declared to be critically endangered by IUCN. Very, very correct. They are critically endangered. Their number is very, very limited. Their habitat is under increased threat. Now, they are endemic to the western semi-arid landscape of India. This is incorrect. Endemic means what? That they are to be found naturally and originally in that area. Whereas when you talk about sociable lap wing, they are to be found in India, but only as a migratory species. They come to the region around Gujarat when during the winter season. Right. They migrate during the winter season and that is when they come to India. The Nal Sarovar wetland. That is where they come in increased quantities. Okay. This is again something you have to keep in mind. Where is it that they come to? Right. So they are only migrating to India during the winter season when the climatic conditions in Central Asia, they become extraordinarily harsh. That is when they come here in the warmer areas of Gujarat. Okay, and Nal Sarovar, that is why, has been declared as an important wetland in order to conserve them. Especially during the drier seasons, nowadays what is being practiced and what is being done is, the normal boating activities which used to be carried out in Nal Sarovar, that has been put to a halt during the dry seasons when the water level is down. Why? Because that acts as an inhibition for these birds. And that is why bird watching as an event, as an activity is being promoted in order to ensure that these birds, they come in larger numbers. And that is when their numbers are slightly increasing, but then hunting and poaching is still being carried out. So which of the above statements is or are correct? So here you have only one statement which is correct and that is A, one only. That is the only statement which is correct. Second is incorrect. You have to know it is a migratory bird. It is endemic where? In the region of Central Asia. That is where you will find them in large quantities. They come to India when? During the winter season. Which part of India do they come to? The region around Gujarat. What is their IUCN status? Critically endangered. Okay? Now, with reference to biodiversity hotspots, Consider the following statements. These are places on earth that are both biologically rich and deeply threatened and are devoid of human population. Can the statement be correct? If you talk about biodiversity hotspots, obviously the first thing that will come to your mind is these are the areas where the biodiversity is present in increased quantities. But can that region be devoid of human population? No. Close to a billion people, they live in areas which have been demarcated as biodiversity hotspots across the globe. Across the globe, you have close to around 36 biodiversity hotspots which have been declared. And they have been declared in order to ensure conservation to the best standards. So the first statement is incorrect. Why? Because it is not devoid of human population. Endemism of plant species, especially vascular plants and habitat loss forms the important criteria for an area to be identified as a hotspot. This is correct. In fact, these are the only two criteria which, uh, which are actually considered that how many plant species are endemic to that region. Generally, in biodiversity hotspots, you have more than 1,500 to 2,000 endemic species which are cons uh, considered. So, those plant species are to be found specially and only in those regions. But at the same time, there has to be a considerable loss of habitat for an area to be declared as a hotspot because that basically signifies that it is only in those areas where you find such kind of biodiversity at its level best. And hence, they have been declared as hotspots. So here, which of them are correct? You have second which is correct, the first, which is incorrect. 
Ideally, when we talk about biodiversity hotspots, they are present almost across the globe, right? They are present across the region of South America, North America, almost across all the continents other than Antarctica, right? Now, here, you are not supposed to remember or learn all the different biodiversity hotspots. They are more than 35 in number. They are close to around 36. So you are not expected to learn all of them out there. What concerns you for the exam is basically the hotspots lying in India, the biodiversity hotspots which exist in India. Now, this is where you have to be very, very careful that in India, ideally, you have four different biodiversity hotspots which lie here. Look at this. You have one, two, three, and four. Right? So when we talk about biodiversity hotspots in India, one is the Himalayan biodiversity hotspot. Right? The second is the Indo-Burma which extends across the northeastern states and the part of Andaman Islands. Then you have Sunda land, which extends in the region of Nicobar, right? And the region around Great Nicobar. So there you have the Sunda land biodiversity hotspot, which many of us tend to forget just because it encompasses through part of the Nicobar territory. And obviously, you have the Western Ghats and the Sri Lanka region. That is also a biodiversity hotspot. So four different biodiversity hotspots, they pass through the country. And if you will notice, all of them, they are typically very, very rich in plant species. And many different plant species are endemic here. That is, they can be found originally in these locations only. The Himalayan ecosystem, if you consider, that is so very unique in terms of the temperature conditions, in terms of the rainfall quality, and also in terms of the altitude that you have very specific kinds of lichens and other plants which grow there. Similar is the case with the eastern part of the eastern Himalayas and so on. That is why when we talk about the floral and faunal species, very unique species are found specially in these regions. Okay, Sundaland extends even to Southeast Asian countries and the island archipelagos that we have, including the Malayan archipelago and also the Indonesian archipelago. So there you have the existence of Sundaland ecosystem. Okay. Now, one of the very factual questions out there, but then just because it has been in news, so let us discuss this as well. With reference to India's biodiversity, Eric's Vitakari, Western Ghats bronze back, Walls keel back, and Boiga andamanesis are what are they? Right? Which species are indicated here? So, again, very factual. If you know it, you know it, else you don't know it. But in any case, I hope that now you know it. So, these are all types of reptiles. So, they represent reptiles. Right? They have been found recently across these areas. And as you can see, that we have looked at the part of biodiversity hotspots, and especially in the region around Western Ghats and the region around Andaman Nicobar Islands, that is where you find them in increased quantities. Okay? Now, these are the different reptiles. Now, you don't need to particularly learn all these names of the reptiles. Ideally, if you are aware of the, or you can form a kind of a connection that, okay, this name, I read it somewhere that it was a reptile. Fair enough. You can solve the question by elimination. If it gets more factual than this, ignore that question. Be on the safer side. Now, consider the following. Gene banks, zoos, National Park, Botanical Garden, and Wildlife Sanctuaries. Which of the conservation methods given above are called in situ conservation of biodiversity? Now, yesterday we talked about in situ and ex situ. A couple of you also got the misconception regarding that I told you about uh, national parks being a kind of a conservation method. Let us analyze this in situ and ex situ again. When we talk about in-situ conservation, 
What do we mean by that? We basically mean that here the conservation is carried out in that original location itself. You are not actually transporting the animals somewhere else in order to conserve them. Wherever they are found in their natural habitat, you are building the ecosystem or you are protecting the ecosystem in such a way, you are forming a protected area whereby they can be conserved. So out of all of these, if you take a look at gene banks, here you are building up a gene pool. You are bringing the genes from somewhere else and building up a pool in some centralized location or a repository. So it will come under ex situ because you are transporting it. So that is ex situ, right? Zoo. Zoos are again, are they the natural habitat? No. You are transporting animals from their original habitat and there you, you are keeping them somewhere else for conservation purposes. So this is also ex situ. National park on the other hand, there you have the natural protection being carried out in the place where these animals are found in their natural habitats. By the way, we know that 1 and 2 already are incorrect. Wherever 1 and 2 is present, eliminate that. Okay? Botanical garden, again, these are artificially built up areas, right? Where you bring different species for protection and conservation ex situ, wildlife sanctuaries along with national parks, they will form in situ conservation. So I hope whatever uh, confusion was prevalent yesterday, now today it is clear that national parks and biodiversity reserves or rather even biodiversity reserves and wildlife sanctuaries, tiger reserves, all of them, they are a part of in situ conservation method. And I hope that you now understand the difference between in situ and ex situ conservation method. Now, consider the following statements with respect to Kaiser e Hind, which was recently in news. Again, too much of discussion on Kaiser e Hind has been happening for the past six months. So I think you should be aware of this. It is a state butterfly. By the way, this is how the butterfly looks like. This is Kaiser e Hind. And I hope that you are able to figure out why the name has been ascribed because of the very unique color pattern. It is the state butterfly of Arunachal Pradesh. Correct. It is found only in India. Incorrect. It is found in Southeast Asian nations as well, around the region of Laos, Cambodia, all these Southeast Asian, even in Myanmar you will find them. In India, you find them in the northeastern part. It is protected under Schedule 1 of Wildlife Act 1972. Incorrect. Why? It is protected under Schedule 2. Right? Here again, please don't get into the trap of learning each and every schedule and which species is housed under which schedule. If you have come across it, Fair enough, you will have a good attempt in the examination if that question comes. But please understand that just shows a different level of protection out there. So, which of them are correct? You have the answer that is A. That is one only is correct. And this is Kaiser e Hind. Why this has been in news? Because it has been declared as the state animal of Arunachal Pradesh. Consider the following statements about whale sharks recently in the news. Now, whale shark, look at this, this is a whale shark, okay? Now, whale shark campaign was launched by the Wildlife Trust of India in 2021. The year is incorrect. It has been almost 10 years now when this had been launched, more than that in fact, right? So this is incorrect. Now we know that one is incorrect. It is listed as endangered on the IUCN red list. This part is correct. Then, it feeds on large fishes and is found in all tropical oceans of the world. It feeds on large fishes. This part is incorrect. Whale sharks are basically filter feeders. They feed on very small 
different nutrients which are in existence they don't feed on large fishes at all right they are a variety of filter feeders they are also not consumable by humans by the way okay so here you see that they do not feed on large fishes so one and three are incorrect and that is what we had to find which of them are incorrect so the answer will be c that is one and three only now coming to the last question with reference to cold water corals which of the following statements is or are correct cold water corals generally they are to be found at greater depths we know that normal coral polyps they have the presence of algal species of zooxanthellae around them to carry out photosynthesis and give them food but coral polyp on the other hand is basically an animal it is an animal species that is something you always have to remember and that is why they have a kind of tentacles with those tentacles they trap food and they have a very simple digestive system digestive tract through which that food is then ingested okay they are generally found in those areas where sunlight doesn't reach and that is why because they are found in those areas you cannot have algal growth you cannot have growth of zooxanthellae because photosynthesis cannot be carried out okay now they do not have symbiotic algae living in their polyps this is correct that is why they depend on themselves to carry out the feeding activities there are more cold water coral reefs worldwide than tropical reefs so as per the reports of united nations environment this is true and this is correct that across the globe you have more coral, cold water corals which are lying on the base of the ocean floor in certain continental slopes in certain continental rises and also in higher latitudes so these cold water corals for example you have the rost reef of the coast of norway it is very very big very very humongous right so cold water corals many of them have not even been discovered till now the tropical water corals they are very easy to find out because they will be very close to the coastline and they will be present in shallow waters it is these corals which are difficult to find which are present in the darker parts aphotic zones of the ocean even okay so here select the correct answer which are the correct ones you have c that is both one and two are correct okay so that brings me to the end of the session today we have discussed not only about various different species in news various different protected areas which are in use we have tried to form a link in order to be able to recall quickly please ensure that in each of these species you are particular enough when it comes to the iucn status but please do not go for blind rote learning because you will forget very very quickly so try to form an association try to form a visual recollection that will help you in the prelims examination tomorrow we meet again and tomorrow we will talk about the various conventions and laws which have been in discussion for the past year thank you for being with us throughout all the best goodbye